What to expect when you're electing. I thought it was a cute title. As we barrel into 2020, as we gear up for yet another hotly contested election and what many people regard as the most divided time in our nation's history, and of course not counting, I suppose, the Civil War and perhaps the Civil Rights Movement and perhaps all those protests over Vietnam, etc., etc. Well, as we barrel into yet another big dollar election, which is sure to aggravate the living piss out of literally everyone right up until they go to cast their votes, well, there's a number of things I find go under-discussed. Now, this, of course, being because most of our political discussions, the exchanges of ideas, the punditry, and the offering of analyses that were afforded, by and large, come by way of either the mainstream media or the new media, this counting not just YouTubers and the like, and bloggers and the such, but also social media, the sharing of opinions through those hot Facebook takes that everyone just can't get enough of. Part of what I see missing in terms of the discussion about the election, well, it kind of feeds back into the fact that much of political discussion in this hyper-partisan, hyper-polarized time of ours doesn't really reflect much in the way of deeper analysis, as much as it is oftentimes given media pundits or uh, celebrity commentators offering kind of topical, surface-level analyses, and oftentimes stringing in a whole bunch of rhetoric to make sure that their given market stays loyal to them. Let's remember, political reporting these days, well, it functions a bit more like regional sports reporting, in that everyone's got their team, everyone knows who their audience is, and they're going to be damn sure to tell them exactly what they want to hear so that they don't go anywhere, lest they have a channel that dies as a result. Anyway, when it comes to this coming election, I find we've got some interesting sort of well, notions, realities in play to reflect on. Things which sadly should have been glaringly obvious in the last general election back in 2016, but things that people seem to have lost track of. Now, let's say, for sake of argument, that you are a supporter of one or a handful of given candidates. You can either be a pro-Trump MAGA type, in which case you are pretty much squarely pegged for what you are, and there's really not much wiggle room as the MAGA set. Well, it's not very critical. Let's just be honest. Or likewise, let's say you're a diehard Sanders fan, or a Warren fan, or I don't even know that they exist, but a Klobuchar fan. Well, in this respect, you'll typically find yourself looking at electoral politics and looking at it through a lens which well, helps you define the best way for your preferred candidate to get to office. But with this, a lot of the nitty-gritty, a lot of the, well, the sort of underlying realities to campaigning in elections seems to go woefully disregarded or underreported upon. One of these such things is the ground game. Now, in 2016, we got a beautiful example of how important the actual act of campaigning really is. Even though the pro-Trump MAGA world likes to say that Trump won this huge election victory with a massive mandate, and that it's just handfuls of whiny libs who don't like him, the reality is, is that Hillary Clinton lost that election just as equally as Trump won it. Trump, to his credit, campaigned like a crazy person. He held rally after rally, couldn't get enough of them, still does them, even though he's president now. The majority of his talks to the public usually come by way of either quick hit chopper talks where he talks about how everything he does is the best, or his massive rallies, rallies which are, well, reminiscent of, well, countless other world leaders in history. But all the same, Trump's ability to campaign, to mobilize, to fire up his base is largely what created the movement which keeps him aloft as well as what got him into office. But at the same time, Clinton, by virtue of what I can only really describe as political hubris, uh, walking into both the primary and the general assuming that she had been anointed, that it was her time, well, was largely lambasted by lower sections of the party for not really campaigning much at all. With Clinton's campaign, there was generally more time spent rubbing shoulders with big donors at uh, high-dollar dinners than there really was actually barnstorming, you know, holding the kinds of rallies which mobilize and whip up a base that inspire people to believe that your leadership is something that they should believe in. 
This, of course, likely being because in addition to just believing that she was the anointed one and that it was just her time, well, much like much of the media, she tended to guess that, well, who's going to really go and elect Donald Trump? It's a silly, silly idea. Perish the thought. Listen, let's just coast on into the general and, oh my god, look at that I lost. Now, as we approach 2020, especially as we see the sort of developments in the Democratic primary, it's an interesting thing because how the primary plays out can give us a pretty strong expectation as to what we can see when it comes to the general election next year. Or, well, sorry, rather later this year. I keep forgetting that the calendars have turned over. But take, let's take, well, let's take top four candidates as it was. Now, we're going to exclude discussing Yang and, T and, and Tulsi Gabbard here, uh, not to alienate their bases or because I don't like them, but rather just because if we're going to be realistic, their chances of actually winning are so slim that they're not really worth digging into. But let's take Biden, Sanders, Klobuchar, and Warren, adding Klobuchar in there as charity, I suppose. Now, when it comes to what the bases are looking for, what this election is ultimately going to come down to is turnout. There are not huge swaths of undecided voters who are going to swing one way or the other, especially given the overall divisive nature of politics as a whole, and the fact that there are very, very few people left around without one or one, one form or another of a very solid opinion of what they think Trump and his administration have been like. When it comes down to the general election, Trump, as he's been throughout the course of his administration, is going to rely solely on his base, reaching out to new voters, reaching out to people who may be, well, opposed to him and convincing them to come over to his side is not exactly something that we should expect. Because as we know, Trump is an egocentric individual and his movement, it's not one based around actual ideas, despite the fact that rhetoric about a wall and being tough around the world and trade wars and greatest economy ever and all of the other sort of propaganda and dogma he puts out there suggests to his base that he's full of them. The reality is it's the personality cult around Trump which seems to drive a lot of people. If it's not just a matter of owning the libs, it's this notion that he tells it like it is and he's draining the swamp. Now, any objective analysis shows that that's really not the case. The man lies through his teeth on a very constant basis and as far as draining the swamp goes, it was more just a shuffling of lily pads on the surface of the swamp to, well, to get the preferred arrangement. Even right now, so many of the same people who were the architects behind the Iraq war have been, well, Having the, having the presidents here, and even beyond this, a majority of appointments have been big donors, industry insiders and lobbyists, the very people that he promised he was going to drive out of Washington. But all the same, despite all of this, his base is unwavering and unquestioning in their support. Now, what it comes down to in terms of defeating Trump is going to require more than simply an, an antipathy towards his administration. And this is why examining these four candidates is interesting. Joe Biden, for lack of a better term, is the perfect embodiment of the establishment Democratic Party. He was previously referred to as the senator from MasterCard. He blows around like a rudderless political sailboat to a point in which, well, voting and leading the charge for one war is, well, that's something he just, he had to learn the hard way about, despite the fact that it was the nation that paid, not so much him. Joe Biden is an old and well, sleepy politician. He doesn't inspire much in the way of enthusiasm in really anyone. Though some people do like the idea of perhaps returning to the Obama era after having endured the Trump administration, Joe Biden as a candidate just isn't exciting. People look to him because they see that probabilistically maybe he has the best shot overall of beating Trump. But then we go to people like Elizabeth Warren. Warren is something of a divisive character. To some, her progressive rhetoric, well, it, it sends out a sense that she is indeed a genuine progressive change maker, a reformer who really wants to get in there and shake things up. But her history uh, leaves a lot to be desired. Likewise, in, if we're just talking in terms of actual voter turnout, though Warren could very likely rise, raise a nice strong base on her own and mobilize an anti-Trump vote as well, her overall campaigning style, it leaves a great deal to be desired. Once again, the enthusiasm for Warren largely tends to come from people who simply unquestioningly listen to her progressive-sounding rhetoric, think, that sounds nice and doesn't sound too extreme, 
or perhaps they just want a woman president, which, as we all know, doesn't really mobilize enough people to really get the change made. Then we have Klobuchar, who once again I'm mentioning, well, sheerly out of charity, I suppose you could say. She, likewise, does not inspire a whole lot of enthusiasm. There aren't throngs of people clamoring for a Klobuchar administration as much as there are numbers of people who really like the fact that her entire campaign seems to be based, as her debate performance has been, around just saying Trump is bad. Well, yes, Amy, we get it. Trump is bad. This is why I feel, from my, well, position as a YouTube pundit, I suppose, but also as somebody who's worked election cycles and has watched closely and also knows a lot about what a ground game really means, that I think just as so many within the lefty and left of center media are starting to catch on to, despite mainstream industrial media not really liking the idea, is that Sanders, surprise, surprise, might actually have the best chance of beating Donald Trump. Why is this? Well, because much in the same way that Donald Trump is so successful at mobilizing his base, at getting them fired up, really making them believe in whatever it is he's saying, getting them out and making them proud to don their MAGA hats and to, you know, scream Trump and talk about lock her up and all of that. His ability to mobilize his base is mirrored largely, I feel, within the Sanders campaign. This isn't just because there's a whole huge throng of democratic socialists who can't wait for a communist takeover of America, as I'm sure I will see screeched in the comments down below, but also because Sanders is a, well, to put it mildly, he's an aggressive campaigner. The man is a barnstormer, rally after rally. He cannot fill his schedule up enough, and not even a heart attack could take him off of the campaign trail for more than, it seems, about a week. His base is fired up and energetic, and not without good reason. In the same way, nobody gives a shit about Amy Klobuchar. In the same way, Elizabeth Warren divides people because her history and her rhetoric does paint a picture as perhaps somebody who would like more to be in power than to actually wield power for a purpose. And in the same way that Biden is the embodiment of the dull, big money, financial institution-backed Democratic Party, which gave us Hillary Clinton last time. Sanders has a long and consistent track record, not just in terms of what he stands for and believes in, but also in terms of his skills and abilities as an organizer. And this is actually reflected in his campaign. If we look at the most recent uh, funding uh, totals, the fundraising totals, in which he came out greatly ahead of just about well, of everyone else in the pack, I think nearly 10 million uh, more uh, on average. And we see that this is largely coming through by way of very small dollar donations, meaning that there are lots and lots and lots of people who are willing to give money in support of this candidate. We also have to reflect on the way his campaign is structured at the very lowest levels. Whereas the Clinton campaign maintained offices and perhaps sometimes put people out in the streets or had them make phone calls, she again was somebody who was resting on her laurels, a victim of hubris, just believing it's her time and that nobody's going to vote for this buffoon over her. She's a Clinton after all. Sanders in no way takes anything for granted when it comes to elections. And he's also not afraid to actually go into what some refer to as the lion's den, an attempt to speak to and convince the opposition. We saw this in his Fox News appearance just a few months ago in 2019, where he willingly stood up there, sat in the Fox News office, took every question that they had honestly, answered it as honestly as he could, and didn't waver in his support for what it was he believes. In terms of his ground game, Rather than focusing on the high-dollar fundraisers and celebrity endorsements that so many other Democrats tend to rely, sometimes exclusively, upon, Sanders' game is focused almost exclusively on driving out real turnout. Going out into the communities, going out into the neighborhoods, knocking on doors, handing out leaflets, making those phone calls, the emails, the communications, the overall outreach is the nature of a ground game. I know the effectiveness of this because I've run statewide ground games in multiple states myself, and I've seen that, much to the surprise of some, the general electorate itself is not really as well reflected by the media or the new media or social media as some people might be led to believe. 
It can be easy if you get so much of your politics to believe that everyone has got a diehard side and that they either hate the fascists or the communists and that that's the totality of the battles that we have going. And that liberal can mean anything from an actual progressive to somebody who loves rubbing shoulders with fascists just because they say free speech enough times. The real electorate's not really, it's not really that diehard. In fact, more or less, it's kind of apathetic. It finds elections annoying, and it's interested more in hearing what a candidate actually plans to do rather than just the rhetoric, rather than just the lofty sorts of rhetoric and the ideas and sloganeering that they tend to rely upon themselves. Within this, much in the same way that Trump can count on his diehard base to turn out in droves no matter what he does, Sanders, likewise, has the strength of a genuine organizing background. The ability to go out and speak to people, to convince them, to not only donate, to not only perhaps support or, or pledge to actually go to the polls and vote, but in many times also to not just work for the campaign, but to volunteer. In fact, one of the main stabs of his overall campaign, and I get mailings and communications from every conceivable political party and campaign you can imagine because of my history. Whereas most of them ask for money, whereas most of them try to bash their opponents, Whereas most of them come out with what are generally stale rhetorical taglines and bits of propaganda. The number one thing I find the Sanders campaign consistently asking for is, are you willing to volunteer? Are you willing to help us spread this message? Are you willing to build the sort of ground game that's needed to really swing an election? It's for this reason, the fact that much of the way that Trump can fire up his base, that Sanders is able to build and fire up one himself, that I actually believe... Bernie Sanders not only has a really good shot of taking this primary, provided that the superdelegate fuckery that we saw take place in the last cycle doesn't occur once again, but that I believe he also has the best chance of actually beating Trump in the general. Because while the two of them will campaign furiously all across the country, imagining what those debates would actually be like... To see Trump stumbling on his words and, and falling back onto his standard propaganda lines, and to see Sanders aggressively attack every position he can think of. Well, if nothing else, we can be sure that it will be a hell of a show. Much like in 2016, given the nature of the political divides and the nature of the electorate, the deciding factor in 2020 is going to be turnout. Fundamentally, It'll be the building of, maintaining of, and turning out of diehard bases who genuinely want to see the candidates who are on the ballot elected, and the numbers that they're able to turn out, which will ultimately decide this election. But hey, what do I know? I'm just another dipshit on YouTube, right?